then to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, and let's get started with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is without error. Thank you that you've preserved it for us. Bless this time that your truth may be preached clearly and, and understood. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Romans 9, 10, and 11 is a portion of the book of Romans that deals with Israel during the dispensation of grace. And so just to be clear on what I mean by that, the time period in which we live today is called the dispensation of grace. Started with the Apostle Paul. It will end with the catching up of the body of Christ, what people commonly call the rapture. This period right here is the dispensation of grace. What people sometimes wonder about the dispensation of grace is, What's going on with Israel during the dispensation of grace? In time past, Israel was God's chosen people. God chose Abraham. He made of him a great nation. That's the nation of Israel. That's time past. We live during a time that, that Ephesians 2.13 calls, but now. It's different from the past. It's also called the dispensation of grace. Well, what happens with Israel today? Romans 9, 10, and 11 is, is uh, the answer to that question. So we'll start in Romans 10, verse 3. For they, the they is Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. In other words, what that tells you is that Israel was self-righteous. They were going about to establish their own righteousness rather than submitting themselves to what God intended for them. What that tells you is that Israel didn't really understand how God's righteousness works. Look with me at Romans 10, verse 4. Notice this. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, but to whom? To everyone that believeth. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this verse because this is uh, largely misunderstood. So first of all, get with me. We're going to come back to Romans 10, but get Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. The first thing that I want to establish is this. People sometimes have the idea that the law is not relevant today. That's a false statement. They, in other words, they think, well, the law, yeah, that, the law was applicable over here, but today the law doesn't matter. It's been done away with. That's not really true. And so I want to show you that. So first start in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. So in other words, when God gave the new covenant, that made the first covenant old by definition, because it's not as new as the new one. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now notice this. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. If something is ready to vanish away, you know what it hasn't done? <laughs> it hasn't vanished away. So what Hebrews tells you is that the old covenant, the Old Testament law, that's not done away with until after the second coming. The Old Testament law is still in effect. What Romans 10, 4 said, and by the way, turn with me to Romans 3. What Romans 10, 4 said is, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, but then it said, to everyone that believeth, meaning 
He's not the end of the law if you don't believe. Look with me at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And what I'm saying here is this. The Old Testament law did not end at Christ's death because the lost remain under the law. Those who are saved are not under the law, but the lost are. Look with me at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Why? That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. According to Romans 3.19, what is the purpose of the law? Does the law tell you how to get to heaven? Does the law give you righteousness? According to that verse, it makes you guilty. Let me give you an example. I don't know if you ever had this experience. One of the things that's common when you witness to people about the gospel, one of the most common things people will say is, I keep the Ten Commandments. It's a very routine thing for people to say. Now, when they do that, the first thing is, one of the commandments is, thou shalt not bear false witness. So is there any point in your life where you've told a lie? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. Another thing in the Old Testament law, or in the Ten Commandments, is to honor the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is on Saturday. How many people on earth truly honor the Sabbath? According to the dictates of the Old Testament law. For example, the Old Testament law on the Sabbath, you can only journey so far. And by the way, the Old Testament law is not simply the Ten Commandments. There's over 600 points of law in the Old Testament. Does anyone know what the Old Testament law says about how you build the roof of a house? Do you know the Old Testament law as it pertains to bird nests? Do you know what the Old Testament law says about using different threads in a piece of clothing? See, the Old Testament law deals with all those things. It doesn't just say, thou shalt not kill. It talks about clothing. It talks about bird's nests. It talks about sowing seed in field, about how you can do that. My point is this, when Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. If you actually read the Old Testament law, do you know what it's going to do? It's going to declare your guilt. Because among other things, what it's going to do is it's going to inform you Wow, I violated dozens and dozens of things, and I had no idea. It's not just the bearing false witness, it's that. But it's a bunch of other things, too. Look at verse 20, Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in, this, in his sight. So can anyone get saved under the Old Testament law? It's not possible. It's not possible because no one keeps it. We have a sin nature. Our sin nature is rebellious and wicked, and it violates the law. It is impossible for anyone to be justified under the law. What does the last part of Romans 3.20 say? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So here's what the Old Testament law does, and this is why this, this matters. When you talk to people about the gospel, one of the things they commonly say is, I keep the Ten Commandments. No, you, you, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't. When you read the Old Testament law, you should be left with a single impression, and that is, I am guilty in a vast and deep and unfixable way. Right? I have violated so many different provisions on so many different occasions. I'm not justified before it. I am deeply, deeply guilty. And that's why Romans 3.20 says, For by the law is the 
knowledge of sin. In other words, as you read the Old Testament law, you realize, well, I'm not having a good day just because I didn't rob a bank. There's a bunch of other things I did that are displeasing to God. So what the law does, its function is to declare guilt. Okay? Look with me at Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. And verse 22. Galatians 3.22 But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise of faith by Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Notice verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept unto the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So here's what the law does, and it does it very, very well. What the Old Testament law does is it declares a man guilty before God, and it declares you guilty in way after way after way after way. And one of the things that should do is, after you realize that, you should realize, well, if my plan to get to heaven is by keeping the law, it's just not going to happen, right? Because I violate it, I have violated it all the time, and I continue to violate it. So what that means is I need a different answer. Well, in the Old Testament law, there were sacrifices for sins. God knew that Israel wasn't going to be able to fully keep the law or adequately keep the law. So he provided a solution, and that solution was sacrifices, animal sacrifices. Well, for us today, we don't need to do that. Look with me at Galatians 3, verse 24. We just read it, but let's look at it again. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. In other words, what the law does is it looks at you and it says, guilty, 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 and it declares that. And then it leads you to the answer, look at this, to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So what happens today with the lost man? The lost man today remains under the law. And he remains under the law, and the law declares him guilty. And this is just the way it is. When, when you talk to, to people, their, their general sense of things often is, I'm not perfect, but I'm basically a good person, right? And so what happens is when we get to the great white throne judgment, God will put my good works on this side and my bad works on that side, and the good, they're going to weigh more. I'll be okay. But the problem is this. The judgment at the great white throne is not putting your good on one side and your bad on the other. The judgment at the great white throne is this. Have you ever sinned? Give with me Revelation 21.8. We're coming back to Galatians 3, but get, get Revelation 21.8. You need to understand what the, the, the burden of proof or what the test is at, Revel at, uh, at the great white throne judgment. Revelation 21.8. So when people think of Judgment Day, what they're thinking of is, is Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, now notice this, and all liars. So what happens if you didn't do the first seven of those? You okay then? You good? How many murders do you have to commit to be a murderer? One is the right answer, right? Well, how many lies do you have to commit to be a liar? One. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So let's make sure we understand what Revelation 21.8 is really saying. If you have ever lied... That makes you a liar, and therefore that single act, if that's all you ever did, if other than that you lived a perfect life, that single act would be sufficient to justify your going to the lake of fire. Now what that tells you, can someone be justified by the Old Testament law? 
way. There's absolutely no way. Because the standard of proof is not, did I do more good than bad? The standard of proof is, have you ever sinned ever? And the answer to that is yes, yes, oh, yes, 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 yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, a thousand times, right? That's the standard, and we've all far exceeded it. So go back, go back to Galatians 3. Now, let me just say this. I, I, don't want, to make, I want to make sure this isn't lost. The good news is this. What God does is he sets forth, he gives the law to set forth your guilt. But he also provides the answer. If all God did was declare the guilt without an answer, that would be a sad, sad state of affairs, right? Because we, we aren't able to fix it. But the answer is, Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and change your life. It doesn't say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and tithe. It doesn't say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and join this church. It says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the moment, the instant that in your inner man... You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you realize, wait a minute, the law declares me guilty. I have no hope whatsoever. I'm going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. But hallelujah, Christ died for my sins. I trust what he did for me. The instant you do that, you're saved. That's the, so don't, I mean, like, if you like, if you're like, you know, look, I'm tired. I want to check out. Um, I'm just counting the moments until I can get out of here. That is the thing you need to leave with. In other words, the answer to the, your problem for eternity is you believe what Christ did for you on the cross, you trust Him, and you're saved. Okay? Now go back to Galatians 3, verse 25. Galatians 3, 25. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So here's what happens, and you need to understand this for how your life operates as a saved person. Before you're saved... You're under the law because God wants you under the law because in His grace, He's telling you the truth. You're guilty and you need a Savior. After you get saved, are you under the law? You're not, right? Here's why this matters. The vast majority, or I'll just say many, the way that many churches operate is this. Here's our list of rules. Here's our list of do's and don'ts. If you follow this list, we'll pronounce you righteous. So here's our standard on dress. Here's our standard on giving. Here's our standard on tithing. Here's what you can do and here's what you can't. And if you follow our set of rules, then you're spiritual. But Galatians specifically says that once you've come to faith, once you're saved, you're no longer under a law system. Do you follow me? And so what, what most or many religious organizations want to do, it is, it is most, what they want to do is they want to control you by giving you, here's our list of things you should do and not do. And if you don't follow this list, then you're not spiritual. But the whole book of Galatians is about the fact that once you come to faith, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. You're no longer under a set of rules to please God because he's pleased with what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Let me, let me put it this way. So I came to faith a long time ago. What happens to me on a day-to-day -day basis? How do I think about the failures of my life? Should I do right every moment? Yes. Do I? I don't. And, and by the way, Romans 7 tells you that's the common fate of man. Paul says, that which I hate, that do I. That is, if you're a saved person, that is your experience. And I'm sorry, to, I mean, it is, right? So how should I think about that? How should I cope? How should I think about the fact that I disappoint the Lord in so many ways so often? And the answer to that is this. The moment I was saved, if you're in Galatians 3, look at verse 27. 
For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The moment that I was saved, I was spiritually, not by water, I was spiritually baptized into Jesus Christ. And the good news about that is God is fully satisfied with what Jesus Christ did. You follow me? God is fully pleased in His Son, and I am in His Son by faith. Therefore, the attitude of acceptance and love and, and total forgiveness and reconciliation that He has with His Son, no hostility, no separation, that is what the believer now has when they are in Christ. Do you see how profound that is? Listen, if you're honest, think of it this way. If you're honest with yourself, you know that all the time there's interpersonal problems. There's things where you, 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 you fail and you feel like you fail in, in your performance, in how you relate to people. I wasn't very nice in that instance. I wasn't kind. If you're at, at all honest, you recognize those failures and shortcomings on a regular basis. Well, is God up there waiting with the hammer? Oh, I know he's going to he's going to speed. I can see it coming. He's going to get in the left lane. He's going to go too fast and I'm going to just whap him. That's not the way that it works. Because if that were the way it works, then your relationship with God would be constantly strained. Right? And by the way, it would be strained if nothing else than just your thought life. And if you don't believe that, then write them all down this week. Come next week. I'll give you 15 minutes. You can stand up and read them. Right? What I want you to get is this. The moment you have faith in Christ... In other words, the moment that you believe Christ died for your sins and you're trusting Him rather than trying to earn acceptance under the law, the moment you trust Him, what happens is you're baptized into Christ, you're complete in Him, and you have total acceptance in Christ that you never need worry about. It's reassuring. You're not going to lose it. God's not going to kick you out of heaven. Does He say this? Does He say, wow, yeah, I saved Steve Zimmerman. I was happy about that, but I had no idea he was going to do this. Is that what happens? Is he surprised? <laughs> He's not. What I'm just trying to communicate is this. God wants you to have assurance. He wants you to have certainty. He wants you to feel the acceptance in His Son that He has provided for you. He doesn't want you to go through your Christian life miserable. Amen. Scripture says, 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice evermore. It is Scripture. That's a command, by the way, right? Rejoice evermore. It's an understood you. It's another way of saying you are instructed, rejoice evermore. All right. Look with me at Romans 7, verse 4. The, the entire book of Galatians, just so you know, we're, we're leaving Galatians for the moment. The entire book of Galatians is about the following problem. There were some people that came to believe the gospel of grace. And then what happens is as Paul's going through his travels, he, he travels on to the next stop in his journey. And the folks come in and teach those folks that are saved by grace, well, wait, no, your Christian life now operates under the law. You follow me? And what we saw about the law, does the law produce contentment or does the law produce guilt? It produces guilt. Let me give you another example of this. Think about Genesis 3. God only gave one commandment that man had to obey. You remember that? Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What could be simpler? Hey, guys, there's one commandment. Even you can't mess this up. Oh, yes, we can. Sure we can. So what happens is Adam and Eve eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When God says, Adam, where art thou? Did God not know? He knew. 
But he's calling out the fact that Adam thinks, he won't see me here. I'm hidden, as if you can hide from God. Now notice what happens. The law system produces alienation, right? It produces guilt. Adam hid because he knew he was guilty, right? So it produces guilt. It produces of avoidance, alienation, right? It produces blame. What did Adam say? The woman that thou gavest me. Hey, God, it's really twist your fault, right? That's all the natural result of being under a law performance system because you're going to fail to meet it and then there will be guilt, blame, avoidance, rationalization. That's why it's so critical to understand that once you come to faith in Christ, you're no longer under the law. Romans 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Is the law relevant to you now? Apparently it's not. That ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So you see the point. What Romans 10.4 is saying is Christ is the end of the law. We used to be under it. He's the end of the law for righteousness, but only to those that believe. Romans 10.5 for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Get with me Leviticus chapter 18. What the law really is, is it's this list of commandments that if you keep them, you'll live. So notice with me Leviticus 18. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5. Leviticus 18, verse 5. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. Do you see how the law system is a conditional system? What's the big word in that sentence? If, right? If you do this, you get the blessing. Well, whenever you use the construct if, you're also creating the construct if not, right? In other words, if you do this, you get the blessing. Okay, but what happens if I don't? Well, then I, I don't get the blessing. Get Ezekiel 20. Now, while you're turning to Ezekiel 20, let me make this observation. The way the world system works is the world system works on the basis of the law principle. And before you do Ezekiel 20, get Matthew 6 and Ephesians 4. This is maybe the best way to show it. Get Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 has the Lord's Prayer, which is actually never prayed by the Lord. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, what does verse 10 say? Thy kingdom come. What is that a reference to on here? Thy kingdom comes at the second coming of Christ, where Jesus Christ comes to establish his kingdom. Right? And the reason why that's part of the Lord's Prayer is, let's hide the dispensation of grace for a minute. How would people before the cross, how would Israel in time past think about things? Well, what they're looking forward to is, are they looking forward saying, oh boy, we can't wait till Daniel's 70th week is here. That'd be just wonderful. What they're looking for is the establishment of the kingdom. And so what they would be praying is, Lord, thy kingdom come. Now that prayer has nothing to do with the body of Christ. We're not looking for a kingdom to come. We're planning, we're planning on leaving, right? 
Now look at, look at something about the Lord's Prayer. You ready? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, If any man shall not work, let him not eat. It's not the same thing. Now notice verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's a conditional forgiveness. Read verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You know what the Lord's Prayer does? It sets up a system of conditional forgiveness. And that's the way the Old Testament law worked. If you forgave your brother, then you get forgiveness. But what happens if you don't? According to Matthew 6.15, you're not forgiven. There's a, sp a specific parable devoted to exactly that subject. Now look with me at Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians 4, verse 32. Now we're going to see a, a Pauline verse on forgiveness, and you need to notice how it's different. Ephesians 4, 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Matthew 6 and Ephesians 4 are actually opposites. Matthew 6 says, if you forgive your brother, that's first, then God forgives you. Ephesians 4 says, forgive your brother even as God hath forgiven you. In other words, in Ephesians 4, first God forgives you, then you forgive others. In Matthew 6, you got to forgive your brother first before God forgives you. Grace is front-loaded. God gives you the forgiveness first, and then what you should do is you should respond in love and forgive others. Under the law system, you better forgive your brother first or you're in a world of hurt. Now think about this. Here is why, this is my opinion, here is one of the reasons why people have so much trouble with grace. The way the entire world system works is it works on the basis of the law. And I'll prove it to you. You ready? Does your employer pay you before you've worked during the pay period or after? After. And there's good reason for that. Years ago, uh, we hired uh, someone, uh, we hired an employee that was going to work for us. And uh, she went to lunch first day and never came back. And she just decided, I don't know, within the first three hours that I've had enough of this, I'm gone. <laughs> now listen, if we had paid her in advance for that pay period, that would have been a bad decision, wouldn't it? And so what happens is the way the world works, this is just how life is on earth, the world works according to a law system. If you perform, if you first perform, then you get the reward. That's how the world works. And people take that way of operating and they bring that into their spiritual life. And they think that they have to earn God's favor. That's what a performance system is. But the way that grace works is here's what God does. What God does is this. He says, look, you have no ability to earn my favor. The law should have taught you that, right? Because the law declares guilt, 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 guilt. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to freely give you everything. And then live out the rest of your life in light of that grace. And by the way, if you don't, I still forgive you. Isn't that powerful? But what happens is, the way that the religious treadmills of this world work is they don't teach that because it's liberating. I'll give you an example. You ready? Get with me Malachi 3. 
in 2 Corinthians 9. Malachi chapter 3. Actually, get, 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 yeah, get Malachi 3, but let's go to 2 Corinthians 9 first. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man according as he hath purpose, purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. Now what's fascinating there's not a single place in Paul's epistles where he tells you to tithe. It doesn't exist. But people teach tithing all the time. Why do you think they do that? Get with me Malachi 3. Now it's fascinating. I've never heard a preacher take out of the Old Testament and say, brethren, what our church is going to do is we're going to build an ark. They never say what we're going to do is next week we're going to sacrifice some lambs for our sins. They never say that. And the reason why is they'd say, well, that's Old Testament. Yes, it is. Guess what else is? Look, we'll be at Malachi 3. Malachi chapter 3, look at verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Uh, get verse 8. Here's, here's the verse I want. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? in tithes and offerings. And here's the way that verse preaches. And I'm going to be just completely blunt with you. What happens is you can control people a lot better under the law system. Because under the law system, you first have to perform before you get the blessing. What grace says is grace says this. Grace says God fully accepts the person of Jesus Christ. The moment you have faith, you're baptized to Christ. And so the moment of belief, you have complete and total acceptance. Well, if you tell someone that, you can't get them on the religious treadmill of trying to earn God's acceptance. But if you want the offering to go up, what you do is you don't want 2 Corinthians 9. Malachi 3.8 is much more useful. And the way that that preaches is this, brethren, you're not robbing the church. You're not robbing me. Why, who you're robbing is God. Right? Because you withhold the tithe that you are commanded to bring, brethren. Now, they don't preach out of Malachi for how salvation works, but they do that for giving, and you can figure out why. You see the point? It's misuse of the Word of God. To put you under a performance system, because under that performance system, they can control you. Get with me Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 is a verse someone used on me a long time ago. I'll tell you this one. Look at Hebrews 10, verse 25. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking... The assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So here's how that one works. What happens when someone isn't attending as, as often as you'd like? Well, you just grab that verse, brother. We're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. Some of you is that way, Right? And they take Hebrews 10, and they use it like a stick, right? Now, who's the book of Hebrews written to? Hebrews. Now, here's a little fascinating thing. You ready? People think the Word, the, the word of God has errors. Paul's great doctrinal book is Romans. It's written to the Gentile power of the world that explains the cross. Then Hebrews, 
first book after Paul's writings addressed to Hebrews explains the cross to Israel. What a, what a perfect symmetry. People take the book of Hebrews, which has not a thing to do with you today, to beat you over the head with it. Now, by the way, so they want to use Hebrews 10.25 on you? Okay, well, if, if Hebrews 10.25 is for us today, then what about verse 26? For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Does anyone have the audacity to raise their hand and say they don't, they've never sinned willfully after being coming to faith? Are you going to say verse 26 and verse 27 is for you today? You'd be in bad shape if that was the case. Verses 26 and 27 apply in a particular context for the nation of Israel, and it's wrong for you to grab it and try to apply it today. Just as it's wrong for you to build an ark... Let me just make this explicit. Someone was really commanded to build an ark, but it wasn't you. People were commanded to offer animal sacrifices for sins, but it wasn't you. People were stoned for violating the Sabbath day. Try that one. You know, when your neighbor mows his lawn on Saturday, just go on over there with Leviticus and a pile of rocks and say, friend, I'm sorry I have to do this, but the Bible compels me. What's going to happen? You're going to have a prison ministry is what you're going to have. <laughs> now, the point is, all these things are there, but they're not there for you. They're not written there for you. Same thing with the book of Hebrews. But what happens is, here's the way people come to this book. They come to this book having decided what they want to do. So if I want the congregation to tithe more, I don't need 2 Corinthians, I need Malachi. If I need people to show up more, I don't want to read to them out of Paul. Hebrews 10 is the verse I want. And it's all gamesmanship. It's mishandling of the Word of God to accomplish a man's agenda rather than preaching grace, which is the time period in which we live. You see the point. Get with me Ephesians 2. I'm going to cover just a couple more things and I'll close. Ephesians chapter 2. What Satan has done during the dispensation of grace is he has tried to bury the truth of grace as a needle in a haystack. So in other words, here's what I mean. There's not just one false religion in the world. There's many, 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 right? And within just churchianity, there's a multitude of different flavors, right? And here's what happens. The multitude of the different flavors within Christianity is essentially different ways of contaminating the gospel of grace. So I'll give you an example. There's a segment of Christianity that preaches lordship salvation. If he's not the Lord of all, he's not the Lord at all. In other words, you don't get saved by simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to yield every aspect of your life to him. You're crazy if you think you do that. Do you yield every moment of your time to him? Who does that? Who has the audacity to think that they do that? Lordship salvation is one example. There's other segments that say you have to be water baptized to be saved. Do they have verses? They have verses. They have verses that aren't written to us today, but they have verses, right? There's people that say you have to keep the Sabbath. There's people that say you're saved by grace, but if you do certain sins, you lose it. All those views are different from one another. 
It's like Baskin Robbins. You can pick any flavor you like. But the underlying unity they have is they all deny grace. So let me prove that to you. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace, grace is unearned favor. For by grace are you saved through faith, notice, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The des God's design of the gospel is it excludes works entirely. Look with me at Romans 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 6. Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. I want to make sure you understand what Romans 11, 6 is really saying. If it's grace, what percent works is it? Zero. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, what percent grace is it? Zero. Otherwise, work is no more work. So in other words, it's not like it's a line where you can pick any point on the line. It's not something where you're saved mostly by grace, but there's a couple works you got to do. What Romans 11.6 does is there's only two options. You're either saved 100% by grace or 100% by works. Well, let's take the 100% by works. Based upon what we looked at in the Old Testament law, can anyone be saved 100% by works? It's not possible. The law declares your guilt. What that means is you're saved 100% by grace. You're saved by grace through faith in an instant completely apart from works. So let me give you an example. If I get saved by grace and then I rob a bank, am I saved or lost? Saved. Because my works don't matter. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And let me rephrase that. My works don't affect my salvation. They matter. They don't affect my salvation. What happens if this? What happens if I believe the, on Monday I believe the gospel, I believe Christ died for my sins, was buried, and rose again the third day? I trust that. Then on Tuesday I say, the Bible's not true. I renounce the gospel. I'm going to become a Scientologist and worship Tom Cruise. <laughs> what happens? Other than I've obviously lost my mind. <laughs> Did I lose my salvation? No, because my salvation was never based on my continued works. Get 2 Thessalonians 2 and 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, I think I may have told you the second 2 Timothy 2, I may have told you the wrong thing. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. See, the, the moment we believe the gospel, Romans 6 says we're baptized into Christ's death. Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. 2, 2 Timothy 3, 12, all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So is there a reward for the suffering we do on Christ's behalf? Yes. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now let's talk about that verse. People lose their minds on this one because what they do is they say, well, here's what happens. If I'm being tortured for the faith and I deny Christ, then he's going to send me to hell. No, 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 no. The denying him there is that denying him in your works, you end up being denied rewards. That's not a salvation verse. You know how I know that. Read verse 13. Look what this says. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Here's how powerful grace is. You ready? 
Once you believe the gospel, the very moment you believe the gospel, Ephesians 1 says you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You are identified with Jesus Christ, and there is no part of Jesus Christ that goes to hell. Right? What does that verse end with? He cannot deny himself. Once you're saved, you're going to heaven whether you like it or not. There's no act you can perform. There's nothing you can do to cause you to lose your salvation. Even if you quit believing the gospel. See that? See verse 13? If we believe not, yet he abideth faithfully, cannot deny himself. Get 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. First Corinthians 3.10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I, that's Paul, have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. In other words, Paul is the wise master builder. He laid the foundation. The foundation was who? Jesus Christ. Can you build on any other foundation? No. It would be worthless and pointless. So Christ is the only foundation you can build upon, but you can choose how you build. You can choose to build with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, because it's going to be tested by fire. Fascinating, in Jeremiah 23, God's word is compared to a fire. I think that's the relevant metaphor here. That in other words, your service as a believer is evaluated according to the standard of God's word. So you can build with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hair, stubble. Look at verse 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon. So what did that man have to build with? Gold, silver, precious stones, right? Something that wasn't flammable. Verse 14, he shall receive a reward. Verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned. So what did he build with? Wood, hay, stubble. He shall suffer loss, but notice this verse. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Verse 15 is one of the most powerful eternal security verses in the Bible. You can show up at the judgment seat of Christ, at, at the catching up, at the rapture, at the adoption. You're caught up. We then go through the judgment seat of Christ, and what happens is God evaluates our works as a believer. And there's basically two possibilities, either gold, silver, precious stones, and you receive a reward, or wood, hay, and stubble, in which case you don't receive a reward, but are you saved? Clearly. So I'm going to conclude with this thought. There's two things you need to understand. The first is this. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't please God by your works. It's not possible. The only thing that God is satisfied is he is completely satisfied with what Christ did on the cross. The moment that you place your faith in him, that you trust the blood that he shed for your sins, the moment you do that, you are saved and you will never, ever, ever, ever lose that salvation. doesn't matter what you do. Because your salvation isn't maintained by how great you are. It's maintained by what Jesus Christ's faithfulness, and he's never going to fail in that regard. People then say, well, what you're saying is it doesn't matter how you live. No, it matters because what happens is your salvation isn't going to be affected, but will your reward at the judgment seat of Christ be affected? Yes, you're either going to receive a reward because you built with gold, silver and precious stones, or you build with wood, hay, and stubble, in which case, poof, right? It's all consumed by the fire of God's Word, and you're denied a reward. So grace means it matters how you live, uh, but, but, but praise God, God has made salvation simple for us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen? Lord, thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is 
true that it is without error that you've preserved it for us. We thank you for the free gift of salvation. We thank you for the blessings you've given the body of Christ. We thank you for the role that you would have the body of Christ play in eternity. Lord, it is such a, just such an incredible blessing to be in, in the body of Christ. And we praise you for it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.